Hello, everyone. My name is Piyush, and it's my privilege to host this edition of Talks at Google with Roman Krishnarik. Roman writes about the power of ideas to change society. Named by The Observer as one of Britain's leading philosophers, his writings are widely popular amongst political and ecological campaigners, education reformers, and social entrepreneurs. His books, including Empathy, The Wonder Box, and Carpe Diem Regain, have been published in over 20 languages. Interesting fact, this is Roman's second time giving a talk at Google. He was here six years back to talk about empathy, why it matters, and how to get it. An acclaimed public speaker, his talks and workshops have taken him from a London prison to the TED global stage. In fact, his most recent talk, published just 48 hours ago on TED Countdown, has already garnered over half a million views. Today, Roman will discuss his most recent book, The Good Ancestor, a radical prescription for long-term thinking. In this book, Roman explores six concrete ways we can expand our time horizons to confront the long-term challenge of our age, from the threats of climate change to the lack of planning for a global pandemic. It poses a deep introspective, introspective question for all of humanity. Do we have what it takes to become good ancestors that the future generations deserve? The Good Ancestor releases next week on election day. I had the privilege of reading the review copy. It was a profoundly insightful read and my takeaway can be best described in the words of the popular band u uh, The Edge. And I quote, the book our children's children will thank us for reading. Later on during the talk, you will also have an opportunity to ask live questions to Roman. So please don't forget to drop in your questions in the live chat. Without any further ado, welcome to Talks at Google Roman. We're incredibly excited to have you. Over to you, Roman. Thank you so much for that introduction, Piyush. And it's a great pleasure and privilege to be talking to you all about this new book of mine, The Good Ancestor. And I wanna talk to you about some of the ways that we can start exploring and even mastering the art of long-term thinking. But since we are so close to an election around now, um, I'd like to just start with a little story about an election. Actually, an election that happened in the UK at the end of 2019. Now, at the time of the last UK general election, my partner and I decided to give our 11-year-old twins an unusual birthday present. We decided to give them our votes. So we all sat around the family kitchen table, debated the different party manifestos and the electoral system, and then our kids told us where to put the X on the ballot sheet. And in case you're wondering, no, they didn't simply follow their parents' political opinions. Now, why did we do this? We did it because we live in an age of pathological short-termism that systematically ignores the interests and welfare of the generation upon generation of children who will inhabit the future. We know that our politicians can't see past the next election or even the latest tweet, that businesses can't see past the next quarterly report, that nations spike, that, that um, markets spike and crash in speculative bubbles and nations sit around international conference tables bickering away while the planet burns and species disappear. And of course, as individuals, we're constantly on our phones, answering the latest text, clicking that buy now button. This is the age of the tyranny of the now. And I think we all know that we need long-term thinking to challenge the huge uh, issues that are coming our way in the 21st century. We know we need long-term thinking to deal with public health crises, those countries that had a long-term pandemic plan in place like Taiwan, have dealt with COVID-19 much more effectively than those countries which haven't had plans in place like the United States. We need long-term thinking to deal with technological risks that are coming our way, such as artificial intelligence controlled lethal autonomous weapons. We need long-term thinking to deal with racial injustice, which gets passed on from generation to generation in criminal justice systems and everyday culture. And of course, we need more long-term thinking to tackle the global ecological crisis, climate change, biodiversity loss, our addiction to fossil fuels. And there's a kind of paradox here, isn't there, that the need for long-term thinking is incredibly urgent. We need it right here, 
right now. And the way I think about this is that I believe that humankind has colonized the future. We treat the future like a distant colonial outpost where we can freely dump ecological degradation and technological risk as if there was nobody there. And it's a bit like the way when Britain colonized Australia in the 18th and 19th century, they drew on a legal doctrine now known as terra nullius, nobody's land. They treated the continent as if there were no people there. Of course, there were. There was the indigenous population. And I think today what we also have is tempus nullius. We see the future as nobody's time, a similarly uninhabited territory that is ours for the taking. And the tragedy is that future generations aren't here to do anything about this pillaging of their inheritance. They can't leap in front of the king's horse like a suffragette or go on a salt march to defy their colonial oppressors like Mahatma Gandhi or block an Alabama bridge like a civil rights protester. They're given no rights or representation. They have no influence in the marketplace. Now, it can be quite difficult to grasp the scale of this tragedy. So let me show you an image which, which tries to illustrate this called the scale of unborn generations. You can see there in the green circle, the 7.7 .7 billion people who are alive today. Now, over the last 50,000 years, an estimated 100 billion people have been born and died. But both of these are far outweighed by the nearly 7 trillion people who will be born over the next 50,000 years, assuming current birth rates this century stabilize. In the next two centuries alone, tens of billions of people will be born. Amongst them, all your grandchildren and their grandchildren and the friends and communities on whom they'll depend. And so there's a really fascinating question there, really, of how will all those future generations judge us for what we did or didn't do when we had the chance? And someone who really thought about this issue was the immunologist Jonas Salk. He was the guy who, with his team in the 1950s, developed the first polio vaccine. But in later life, he said that the great question facing our time is this. Are we being good ancestors? In other words, how were we going to be judged by future generations? And he believed that if we were going to be judged well and deal with the long term challenges that he was seeing at his time, you know, such as the nuclear threat or the destruction of the living world, he believed that we needed to extend our time horizons. So instead of thinking on a scale of seconds, minutes, and hours, we needed to think on a scale of decades, centuries and even millennia. And if you look around the world, I see a new generation of time rebels dedicated to long-term thinking and extending our time horizons towards a longer now. You see their work in many areas. In the scientific world, for example, there's the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which is protecting the world's plant biodiversity by, uh, by uh, protecting um, by bringing together millions of seeds and collecting millions of seeds in an indestructible rock bunker in the Arctic Circle that's designed to last a thousand years. And then there are projects like the Long Now Foundation's 10,000 year clock that you might have heard of. It's a clock designed to last 10 millennia being built at this very moment in a limestone mountain in the, in the Texas desert. You'll be able to visit it by hiking through the uh, desert to get there, going up steps cut into the mountainside, each of them uh, the equivalent of a million years of geological time. It's almost like a secular altarpiece for a long-term thinking civilization. Now, as I've been talking, you've probably been thinking of some examples of long-term thinking and planning that you might know about. So what I'd love you to do for me now is in the live chat there, I'd like you just to write down one or two examples um, of inspiring or powerful long-term projects that you have come across. So if you could just write down anything that comes into your head, which is about long-term thinking that you find inspiring or powerful, I'd love to uh, sneakily have a look at what you're thinking about. I can see that um, there's already an example of um, Jeff Bezos's or Blue Origin's vision of building a space superhighways to uh, load off all heavy industries into the Earth's atmosphere. That's an incredibly long-term project. It could be decades uh, in the making. There are other amazing projects across Africa, for example, 
There's the Green Belt Movement in Kenya, started in 1977 by Wangari Matai, the first woman to um, African woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize. And her project was about regenerating the natural world by planting tens of thousands. In fact, millions of trees have been planted as part of the Green Belt uh, project, um, the Green Belt Movement. And they've also trained tens of thousands of women in agroforestry skills. So it'd be great if just to see some more of your uh, examples uh, that you're coming up with in the chat. Some of them might be uh, things like in the music world, Gem Finer's 1,000 year uh, music project, uh, which is called Long Player, which started playing in the last moment of 1999. It'll finish at the last moment of 2099. Monica there has put in the example of the American constitution. It's a really interesting example because for over 200 years, you know, the US, unlike many countries, has had the same constitution. It's been changing, but it has a kind of flexibility, a long-term flexibility built into it. Moves for automated transport, Joshua has pointed out there. Uh, again, those are, require long-term investment, long-term thinking. Um, and it's a really, really good example of the way technology can have a long-term perspective as well. But you can stand back and think, OK, there's these examples of long-term thinking around, but how do we actually get really good at long-term thinking? And for that, I believe we need to look inside our own heads, inside our own brains, for example. And I believe that there is a tug of war going on inside our brains between what I call the marshmallow brain and the acorn brain. So do we party today or, plant, or uh, save for our pensions for tomorrow? Do we upgrade to the latest iPhone or plant a seed in the ground for posterity? The marshmallow brain is the part of our brain which focuses on immediate rewards and instant gratification. It's an ancient part of the brain going back uh, nearly 80 million years. And of course, it's named after the famous marshmallow test where a marshmallow was placed in front of kids in the 1960s in this psychology experiment. And if they could resist eating it for 15 minutes, they were rewarded with a second marshmallow. And of course, it turned out the majority couldn't resist and snatched and gobbled up the snack. But the marshmallow brain is not the only part about neuroanatomy when it comes to uh, thinking about time, because we also have this acorn part of our brains. This is the part of our brains which focuses on long-term thinking and planning and strategizing. And it lives here in the frontal lobe above our eyes, particularly a part called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And it's particularly well-developed in human beings. It's only a new part of the brain, just a couple of million years old. Um, getting it into a big time perspective, but it's the acorn brain is more developed in human beings than most other creatures. So chimpanzees, for example, might plan ahead by getting a stick, stripping off the leaves and turning it into a tool to put into a termite hole. But they will never make a dozen of these tools and set them aside for next week. But that is precisely what a human being will do. We are long-term planners extraordinaire. It's the acorn brain which is, enables us to save for our pensions and for our children's education and write song lists for our own funerals. So we need to learn how to shift our attention from this marshmallow brain and do more of this acorn brain thinking. And in my book, the way I explore this is by talking about six different forms of long-term thinking. And I'd just like to show you those uh, now in this um, image here. I call it the tug of war for time. On the left-hand side, are six drivers of short-termism, many of them very familiar, digital distraction, political presentism, the boom bust of speculative capitalism. There's some more surprising drivers of short-termism like the tyranny of the clock. Since clock time emerged with the first mechanical clocks in the 14th century, time has become faster and faster and the future has been rushing forward to us, uh, towards us faster and faster. So by 1700, most clocks had minute hands, by 1800, they had second hands. And of course, now we've got millisecond and nanosecond speed share trading. So that future is rushing towards us. But the six drivers of long-termism are balanced by six ways to think um, long-term. So the short and the long. And I want to talk just about a few of those ways to think long-term. Um, I want to start with cathedral thinking. And that is the idea of embarking on long-term projects and policies with time horizons lasting decades, sometimes even centuries. Greta Thunberg has famously said, we need cathedral thinking to deal with the climate crisis. Now, a lot of people say, look, human beings, 
you know, we're no good at thinking long term. We are just driven by our phones, by that short term marshmallow brain. But here are 45 examples of cathedral thinking uh, from my book from the last 5,000 years of human history. And there are amazing examples around um, in terms of public policy and infrastructure and scientific endeavors and cultural projects. Um, I wanna just say something about a few of them. In the top left-hand corner there, you can see an example of cathedral thinking, which is literally a religious building. That's Alm Minster in Southwest Germany. It was started being built in 1377 when the good citizens of Alm decided they wanted their own church uh, that they financed themselves well, they didn't finish for 500 years. It wasn't finished until 1890, probably the longest crowdfunding project in history. That's cathedral thinking. On the right-hand side, you can see the, the sewers of Victorian London. They were built after the Great Stink of 1858. Up until that time, raw sewage was dumped in the Thames River. But in the long, hot summer of 1858, the stench was so bad, there was a, a crisis, a crisis in the city when even members of parliament couldn't breathe because of the stench. They were wearing masks like they're wearing now. And they finally passed the legislation to build the sewers of uh, Victorian London. And they took 18 years to build 318 million bricks, 22,000 workers, and the, the chief uh, engineer, Sir Joseph Bazalgette, standing at the top there in a, in a top hat above one of the archers. Um, he masterminded this and he decided to build the tunnels for the sewage uh, to go through twice as big as they needed to be. That was long term thinking. And that's why those sewage tunnels are still in use today. And in the bottom left hand corner, you can see the suffragette movement, which emerged in Manchester in 1867. They didn't achieve their aims for at least 50 years of votes for women. It's just a reminder that social and political movements can embody cathedral thinking, too. And that they're, they're often engaged in struggles that will last decades. But, you know, all those examples are really inspiring. But let's remember that cathedral thinking isn't always good for us. It can be put towards very narrow and self-serving ends. Just think that Hitler wanted an 1,000-year Reich, or the regime in North Korea wants to preserve its power and privilege, passing it on from one family generation to the next. Or in the corporate world, too. Uh, a former head of Goldman Sachs, Gus Levy, once said, we're greedy, but long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. Well, that's a very narrow approach to thinking long-term, not really taking into account all of those future generations in that giant orange circle, not taking account of those people or the planet as well. So cathedral thinking is not enough. We need to combine it with other approaches to long-termism to give it a kind of direction. And that brings me on to the second form of long-term thinking I like to talk about today, which is the idea of intergenerational justice. That's the idea of taking into account the welfare, the rights of future generations, uh, embodying our responsibility and obligations towards them in public policy and other realms. Now, it's a challenging area. I mean, Groucho Marx allegedly said, why should I care about future generations? What have they ever done for me? And I think intuitively, a lot of people think like that. I've got enough problems in my life right here, right now. But I think in order to take account of those future generations, of course, we can think about the billions upon billions of people who are going to inhabit the future. But we can also draw, I think, on indigenous wisdom. And let me just um, share now my, my screen and uh, show you an image from uh, a Native American ideal, which you will know about, called seventh generation thinking. This is the idea of making decisions based on the impact seven generations ahead. We find it in many Native American communities, Lakota people, Iroquois people. You find it in the Moluccas Islands in Indonesia and other places as well. But here's a great statement of it from Oren Lyons from the Iroquois Confederacy. He says, we're looking ahead as is one of the first mandates given us as chiefs to make sure every decision that we make relates to the welfare and well-being of the seventh generation to come. And that is the basis by which we make decisions in council. Will this be to the benefit of the seventh generation. And I think this is really an idea of ecological stewardship over the long term. It's about people and planet. But you might ask yourself, well, okay, that's in an indigenous culture, but how do we apply this kind of seventh generation thinking, this kind of uh, embodiment of intergenerational justice in a high speed urban world for the people of Miami or of Mumbai or of Dubai? 
Well, there's some really inspiring examples around the world where people are taking the seventh generation idea, putting them into practice. Let me introduce you to one of them. It's in Japan, and it's called the Future Design Movement. And this is directly inspired by the Iroquois idea of seventh generation decision making. What they do in the Future Design Movement in Japan is they invite local people to discuss and draw up plans for the towns and cities where they live. And typically what they do is they divide people into two groups. Half of them are told that they're residents from the present day. The other half are given these almost kind of ceremonial robes to wear and told to imagine themselves as residents from the year 2060. Well, it turns out that the residents from 2060 systematically advocate far more transformative city plans from healthcare investment to climate change action. And this future design methodology is now spreading from small towns like Yahaba, which you can see in the image there, to major cities like Kyoto. It's even being used in the Japan's Ministry of Finance and by some companies as well. And I'd love to see local communities, progressive towns, progressive companies, getting people dressed up in those orange robes and helping them time travel to the year 2060, which really kickstarts their imaginations. This is an amazing form of citizen assembly methodology to get us to think towards a longer now. But apart from this, there's also important legal struggles going on. The young people you can see there are part of a, uh, a series of legal cases which have been um, pushed forward by a public interest law firm in the US called Our Children's Trust. Our Children's Trust has filed a landmark case against the US federal government on behalf of 21 young people campaigning for the legal right to a safe climate and healthy atmosphere for both current and future generations. And they are involved in a David versus Goliath struggle. It's been going on five years and it's gonna go on probably for more years. And they're also instigating legal cases at the state level as well. And our Children's Trust and these 21 young people called the Juliana 21, they have inspired groundbreaking lawsuits worldwide from Colombia to the Netherlands to Uganda, all about focusing on rights for future people. This is one of the most important shifts in the history of rights since the French Revolution, rights for people who may not be born for decades. And alongside these legal struggles are other legal struggles to grant legal personhood to nature. In the same way that corporations in the US were given legal personhood in the late 19th century, there's now moves for natural or parts of nature to be given legal standing. So in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Wanganui River, sacred to local Maori people, uh, has been given legal rights, legal personhood, or the Ganges and Yamuna rivers in India. So I think these are really fascinating examples of, I think, time rebellion in action, people committed to long-term thinking and intergenerational justice. But moving on from intergenerational justice, I wanna pick up on a third approach to long-term thinking, which is the idea of developing a legacy mindset. Now, leaving our legacies is a really fundamental part of human psychology. When we reach midlife, we start tending to think about how we will be remembered when we're gone. But to think about that, I think we can also look backwards as well and think about the legacies we've inherited from the past. Now, we are clearly the beneficiaries of many positive legacies from history, from those who created the uh, agricultural revolution and launched that 10,000 years ago, from um, people who created the medical discoveries that we still benefit from, who built the cities that we still live in. But we're also the inheritors of very negative and destructive legacies too. Legacies of slavery and colonialism and racism, creating deep inequities that must now be repaired. Legacies of economies that are structurally addicted to fossil fuels and endless growth that must now be transformed. So we need to stop and ask ourselves, well, what legacies are we gonna pass on to the generation to come? Now, when we think about legacy, we might think about it like a Russian oligarch who wants to be remembered, have their name up in lights, get their, a football stadium or, or an art gallery named after them. That's a very uh, egoistic form of legacy. Most of us consider a familial legacy. We want to pass on uh, stuff down to our families, to our kids. It might be um, a home or, 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 or wealth or pass on family traditions and, and religions and culture. But in order to be a good ancestor, I believe we need to 
have a more universal approach to legacy, to think about leaving gifts to the universal strangers of the future. But making that leap to doing things for people who we don't even know way in the future seems impossibly difficult at times, I think, especially in our very hyper-individualistic consumer culture. How do we connect with those future generations and want to leave a legacy for them? Well, I think one way to do it is to use our imaginations. And what I'd like to do now is to take you on a little bit of an imaginative journey, a little bit of a thought experiment. I would like you now just for the next couple of minutes just to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine a young person in your life who you really care about. It could be a nephew or niece or a little brother or sister, one of your own children or grandchildren. Just picture their face. And now I'd like you to imagine them, still with your eyes closed, imagine them 30 years in the future. Again, picture their face. Think about the joys and passions in their lives and the struggles they might be facing. And now still with your eyes closed, I'd like you to imagine them on their 90th birthday party surrounded by family and friends and loved ones and neighbors and work colleagues. Go and have a look out the window. What kind of world is it out there? And now come back and look into their old and maybe wrinkling face and slightly faded eyes. And you see someone come over and put a tiny baby into their arms. It's their first great grandchild. And they look down in this baby's eyes and think to themselves, what will this child need to survive and thrive in the years and decades ahead? Just hold that thought in your mind for a moment. And now open your eyes again and consider that that little baby could be alive well into the end of the 22nd century. Their future isn't science fiction. It's an intimate family fact. Just a couple of steps away from your own life. Now, I know that kind of imaginative experiment can be quite confronting, especially if you've got a bit of a dark vision of the future, like I have, but I think it's really powerful. And it's one I've taken and developed from the work of Joanna Macy and also the Long Time Project uh, in, in England. And I'd like to thank them for that. But certainly when I do that experiment, if I imagine my 90-year-old daughter, my daughter's just 11 at the moment, but if I imagine her at the age of 90, what I get from that is I recognize that she is not alone in the world. She is surrounded by a web of human relationships and also the web of the living world, the air that she breathes, the water she drinks, the food that she eats. So if I'm going to really care about her life, I need to care about all life. So that kind of imaginative experiment of thinking about someone that's close to us can be a bridge, a stepping stone to a, a more universal sense of legacy for those unknown strangers of the future. And there's well, lots of beautiful projects around which embody this idea of a legacy mindset. One of my favorites is a 100-year art project called Future Library, created by the Scottish artist Katie Patterson. And in this project, every year for 100 years, a famous writer is donating a book which will be left completely unread and hidden away until the year 2114, when the 100 books will be printed on paper made from a thousand trees which have been planted in a forest outside Oslo. Now, many famous writers have donated books so far, such as Margaret Atwood, Elif Shafak. And just think, Margaret Atwood is never going to meet any of those readers. She's never going to see that book published in her own lifetime. She'll be long dead. That is an incredible legacy gift to, to, to the future. And we can all think about our own legacy gifts we might want to leave. It's a little bit like the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. But let's stretch it through time. Let's do unto future generations how we would want past generations to have done unto us. So there's three forms of long-term thinking, cathedral thinking, intergenerational justice, and a legacy mindset. Let me introduce you to a fourth kind, which is the idea of pursuing a transcendent goal. Now, the idea of a transcendent goal is something that was really popularized in some ways by um, the great astronomer Carl Sagan. And he believed that 
just as individuals needed to have a long-term goal to direct their lives and give it meaning and purpose, our species, the human species, needed such a goal as well, what he called a telos from the ancient Greek for a goal or objective. But what should the goal for humankind be? Well, I think if we look around in public culture today, we can see three main goals which are potentially out there. One of them I call perpetual progress. That's the idea of pursuing material improvement and endless economic growth. This has been the de facto goal for particularly in Western culture, at least since the end of the Second World War. I mean, even maybe since the Enlightenment in the 18th century. I mean, for the last 70 years, most governments, whether they have been neoliberal or Keynesian or Marxist or whatever, have pursued material improvement and constant GDP growth as their primary policy objective. Now, that kind of material progress has brought enormous benefits, public health benefits and education and so on. But now we know too much, don't we? We know that it has also brought along incredible destruction of the living world, known as the Great Acceleration, because as growth and material improvement has gone up, uh, particularly in the Western world, along with it has come blowing outside planetary boundaries, CO2 emissions, uh, ocean acidification, soil degradation, um, biodiversity loss. And there is no evidence that we can continue growing our economies while dematerializing them and decarbonizing them uh, at a sufficiently fast rate and extensively enough to keep within safe planetary boundaries and keep down to 1.5 degrees of global heating. The evidence just isn't there for what's called uh, absolute sufficient decoupling. Um, even my kids know that. They knew that when they were four years old. They knew that you can't keep blowing up a balloon bigger and bigger with the prospect that it's never going to burst. It is going to burst at some point. So I think we need to shift off from this idea of perpetual progress and endless growth. Now, another option, a second option is the idea of techno liberation, the idea that technology will or should be our uh, long term goal for liberating humankind into the distant future. And Carl Sagan's view here was that what we needed to do in this realm was the ultimate goal for human beings should be to people other worlds, to colonize other planets. That was the only way to stay ultimately safe for the long term, he believed, because we might blow ourselves up or be destroyed by an asteroid. So we need to be on other planets to spread the risk. And today, of course, the focus here is on colonizing Mars, Elon Musk's style. But is that really a good goal for humankind? Well, I'm one who agrees with the uh, British cosmologist Martin Rees on this, who thinks that colonizing Mars, while a lovely idea and great for space tourism, should not be the ultimate goal of humankind, partly because it's such a long term and difficult goal, given the urgency of the issues that we face today. It might take if we want to you know, create a uh, an atmosphere that we can breathe on Mars, terraform Mars, it might take centuries, it might take millennia, it may never even be possible at all. A lot of the evidence is shown today. We might not even get a single person to Mars until 2040. We probably don't have time to wait to colonize um, Mars because of so many urgent issues that we face today. But as Reese points out, he also says the problem with focusing on Mars as the ultimate goal and that kind of space colonization is that there's enormous collateral damage. We will stop caring about this planet Earth. We'll be much more willing to trash it. And the way I think about this. It's a bit like mountaineering. You know, a good mountaineer makes sure that their base camp is in order before they start climbing a risky summit. And we certainly know that we haven't learned, got our base camp in order today, our base camp being planet Earth. We haven't learned to live within the boundaries of this one planet we know that sustains life. So in my view, we should only be aiming for Mars once we've learned to live on this planet. Then once we've can do, once we learned to do that, we can make as many trips to Mars as we like. But that's why I believe our goal should be the third one you can see there, which is the idea of one planet thriving, meeting the needs of all current and future people within the means of a flourishing planet. And this is really about the essence of ecological economics. You know, I studied economics 25, 30 years ago. I never learned about ecological economics, but going back to the 70s, people like Herman Daly have been arguing that real sustainable development for the long term is about creating economies and, uh, and, and systems of, of social life where we're not using more resources faster than they can be naturally regenerated and not 
creating waste faster than it can be naturally absorbed by oceans and other carbon sinks. Yet that is exactly what we're doing. We're using about 1.6 planet Earths every year, probably uh, even more to that than that. And we need to learn to live within uh, this one planet if we want to sustain ourselves over the long term. And perhaps the best expression I've ever found of this idea of one planet thriving comes from the brilliant biomimicry designer Janine Benyas. And I'd just like to now play a short 90 second video for you of Janine Benyas's ideas, which encapsulate this idea of one planet thriving. So here is Janine Benyas. You know, the answers we seek, the secrets to a sustainable world are literally all around us. And if we choose to truly mimic life's genius, uh, the future I see would be beauty and abundance and certainly fewer regrets. You know, in the natural world, the definition of success is the continuity of life. You keep yourself alive and you keep your offspring alive. That's success. But it's not the offspring in this generation. Success is keeping your offspring alive 10,000 generations and more. And that presents a conundrum because you cannot, you're not gonna be there to take care of your offspring 10,000 generations from now. So what organisms have learned to do is to take care of the place that's gonna take care of their offspring. Life has learned to create conditions conducive to life. And that's really the magic heart of it. Life creates conditions conducive to life. And that's also the design brief for us right now. We have to learn how to do that. And luckily, we're surrounded by the answers and you know, millions of species willing to gift us with their best ideas. You know, every time I see that video, it makes the hairs of my arm stand on end. Um, it's so beautiful and she's so poetic. And what she's really telling us is the secret of long-term thinking, that to extend our time horizons is not simply about lengthening time, but it's about regenerating place. It's about restoring, repairing, caring for the one planetary home that will take care of our offspring. That's how we will survive for 10,000 generations or more, by not fouling the nest, by living within the boundaries of this ecosystem in which we are embedded. And of course, this is the opposite of what humans have been doing at an ever increasing pace and scale over the last century. And Janine Benia sometimes um, talks about this beautiful mohawk blessing that encapsulates her idea. It's, it's a blessing that's spoken when a child is born. It goes like this. Thank you, Earth. You know the way. And I think there's a real wisdom there about letting the Earth direct our long term thinking for one planet thriving to be our ultimate goal. But how do we really embody that in public policy, in the way businesses and organizations work? Well, let me show you um, a model of this that I think really captures the work of Janine Benyas absolutely brilliantly. And it is um, a model known as the donut of social and planetary boundaries created by the British economist Kate Raworth from her book, Donut Economics. And the donut is like an alternative to the obsession with GDP growth. It's not about growing, 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 going up the curve all the time. It's about thriving in balance. It's a long-term goal for governments and businesses and beyond. So the way it works is there are these two circles of the donut. There's the inner circle, the social foundation. And the idea is to get people above that social foundation, which has things like water, food, health, you know, ed basics like education. These are developed and derived from the sustainable development goals. So we need to bring people above the social foundation, but without pushing ourselves beyond the ecological ceiling. That ecological ceiling is made up the, of the planetary boundaries identified by Earth system scientists like Johan Ross Rockstrom and, and Will Stefan, things like climate change, biodiversity loss, fresh water withdrawals, and so on. And so the idea is to get into that light green, safe and just space for humanity. That is what thriving in balance is all about. But where are we today uh, when it comes to living within the donut? Well, here is a devastating portrait, a selfie 
of humanity at a global level. We are failing when it comes to the social foundation. So all those red segments there is the amount below our shortfall when it comes to meeting basic social goods and human rights. And then the, there are four of those planetary boundaries where we are way overshooting the ecological ceiling. In fact, we're probably going over more, more of them, but it's just we don't have very precise measures of them. So we need to learn to live within the boundaries of the donut. And the really interesting thing about the donut model is that it has been adopted worldwide increasingly by national governments in Costa Rica, the French government's using it as well. It's also being used by cities. So recently the city of Amsterdam adopted the donut as um, its model for post-COVID economic recovery. And then they were copied by uh, Copenhagen and a bit of peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. And progressive companies have been using the donut as well. I'd love to see you know, big tech companies like Google, for example, putting the donut on the table when big planning decisions are made. I, I believe that long-term thinking needs to have a telos or an ultimate goal to guide it. Otherwise, we're going to just be left with long-term thinking that might be all about long-term greedy or like those Russian oligarchs just wanting to leave monuments for themselves. So we need models like the donuts to help us think long-term. So there is a little bit of an overview of at least four out of the six ways to think long-term. Um, but let me just finish by saying this, that we are in an extraordinary moment of history, a moment of crisis which presents opportunity. The economist Milton Friedman once said, only a crisis, real or perceived, creates actual change. And I think that's a pretty good historical rule of thumb. Look back to the Second World War. Out of the ashes of the war, out of the crisis of the war, came incredible long-term institutions like the World Health Organization, the European Union, the National Health Service in Britain. I think now we need that kind of long-term vision today to help us plan into the distant future, to um, tackle the 21st century challenges around ecological crisis, technological crisis, racial uh, injustice, public health crises. We need to switch off this marshmallow brain, switch on the acorn brain. And I think that if we all become time rebels, we may well become the good ancestors that future generations deserve. And with that, I'd like to stop and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Roman, for such a great, insightful talk. Um, uh, just a reminder to the folks catching us on the live stream, please feel free to drop in your questions on the live chat. Um, I had one question till we get some more questions on the live chat, Roman. You mentioned towards the ending of your talk that we need to have a vision for the future in order to move. So I was wondering if you have, like, I, I, in the third part of your book, you mentioned the importance of mythologies and art in creating that vision. So I was wondering, Roman, if you had any suggestions um, in terms of either movies or novels or art uh, for folks to like really embrace this vision of the future. You know, strangely enough, this was not a planted question, everybody listening, but right here I have the novel for you to read. Kim Stanley Robinson's new book, The Ministry for the Future, is a brilliant um, exploration of long-term thinking. Now, those of you who know Kim Stanley Robinson, you know, a lot of his books are set in the 24th century. I've got piles of them just on my left-hand side here. But this new one, The Ministry of the Future, is actually quite in the near future. It starts about 2025, uh, when the Paris agreements are failing and the world's governments decide to set up a ministry for the future in Switzerland. But it's about how the climate crisis really played out and how humankind responded. And I think people like Kim Stanley Robinson are creating the public conversation we need about long-term thinking. Because the, one of the problems with um, things like Hollywood films, you know, like Geostorm and The Day After Tomorrow or something, things like that, they can be a bit voyeuristic. I think often they don't genuinely move us. And so we need, I think, other forms of art and culture to engage us. Things like the works of Kim Stanley Robinson, the writings of Octavia Butler, Ursula Le Guin, many others tap into our long-term brains, help us switch on uh, our long-term brains. But also, I think we need projects like the 10,000-year clock from the Long Now Foundation, or we need to get engaged in new rituals as well. I recently joined some colleagues, actually, from the Long Now Foundation who have a, a London outpost, and we went to this incredible Bronze Age artwork about 20 miles from where I live in Oxford in the UK, not Oxford, Mississippi, by the way. Um, and what is it is, it's called the White Horse of Uffington. And it's a giant horse 
about 100 feet long, which has been carved into a chalk mountainside. So the grass has been cut away and you can see this white horse, 100 feet long, you can see it for miles around. And basically every year or so for the last thousand years, because it's like 3000 years old, but we know at least for the last thousand years, the local villagers have been going up to do what's called chalking the horse. They bash new bits of chalk into it so you can still see it and they take out all the weeds. And I, a couple of summers ago, I started, you know, with a group of uh, long now colleagues, we went up to the chalk horse and did that chalking ourselves. And now our plan is to go back every year, coronavirus pending. Um, and, and I think those kind of rituals are also part of the cultural response we need to, in, in that sense, it's about developing a culture of maintenance, about looking after stuff, the stuff that matters for the long term. So I'm a big fan of alt art culture novels because I believe we need big political changes because there's not enough changes in our democratic decision making. We need to inject long termism into the DNA of politics and our economies, but culture too. Thanks, Roman. The Ministry of Future will be on my next reading list. <laughs> we have a very interesting question from Jenna, who asks, how can we make a difference when our elected officials are not committed to long term thinking by setting back environmental gains, relying on fossil fuels, etc.? I think politics is the big area of challenge because clearly, you know, so much politics is driven by the short term, by electoral cycles, by corporate funding. Uh, you know, we can see the way in the, 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 the current administration, the US has been, you know, taking off environmental regulations and all that kind of stuff. And I think we can't cross our fingers and hope that just by electing politicians with a long term vision will be fine. I really absolutely believe we need to bring long term thinking into the way democracy itself is structured. And that's why I really like examples like the future design movement in Japan that I mentioned, because it's drawing on the huge energy around the world for citizens assemblies at the moment, where you get uh, local people reviving the ancient Greek idea of participatory democracy in a way, because I think people are losing faith in uh, traditional parties and politicians. That explains the rise of far-right populism across you know, North America, Brazil, Europe as well. We need to revitalize democracy, but by getting people involved, what we found in the research is that these citizens' assemblies, like the Future Design Movement, are much better at taking the long view than your regular politicians because they're not subject to the corporate funding or the election cycle. So that's really important. But there are other models as well, like the legal model of our children's trust. But for example, in Wales, not far from where I live, Wales has a future generations commissioner, which is instigated as part of a something called the Wellbeing for Future Generations Act about five years ago. And many countries are starting to copy the idea of having a future generations commissioner. Uh, Gibraltar now has one. There's movements for the Netherlands to have one. There's a campaign that I'm involved in for the whole UK to have a future generations commissioner. You just need to make sure that they're given enough power. So it's a very tough struggle to change our politics to make it long term. Um, I think we can't cross our fingers. And also, let me say one other thing on this, really fundamental. A lot of people say to me, oh, these democratic politicians, they're no good at long termism. We've got to become more like China, you know, that has long term planning. Look at their, you know, uh, green infrastructure investment. We need to become more like Singapore that has long term investment in um public health care and housing and education, even if there's a cost of a bit of civil and political rights. We need benign dictators, enlightened despots, that kind of idea. Well, it's an interesting idea, but I've looked at the evidence. And in my book, actually, I um, show lots of complicated graphs, which um, actually plot how democratic countries are against how good their long-term public policy is using a new measure of long-term public policy called the Intergenerational Solidarity Index. Well, it turns out that of the 25 countries which get the highest score in terms of long-term public policy, 21 of them are democracies. And of the 25 countries which get the lowest scores, 21 of them are authoritarian regimes of various kinds, monarchies, dictatorships, and so on. So there is no systematic evidence that um, you know benign dictators will save us from our political problems. We need to deepen long-term thinking within democracy itself. China and Singapore are kind of outliers every country could be deepening its democratic long-term vision. 
That's very interesting, Roman, that you mentioned that. I guess it also highlights how desperate people are for a solution, the fact that they're looking at this as a viable solution. And I really enjoyed the part in your book where you like empirically showed that um, democracies are actually well positioned for long-term thinking. We have another great question from Elia, who writes, any advice for what you think Google specifically can do or should do to help? <laughs> I love that question. Well, I think probably all of you listening probably have the best ideas there. I mean, I think the most obvious one is the donut economics model, I think, to, to literally print it out big and put it on the table when you're doing planning and making decisions. Are the technologies you're developing, the new apps, whatever it happens to be, your advertising strategies, are they ultimately aligned with that great goal or tell us of keeping us within the safe and just space for humanity? Are they contributing to bringing us above the social foundation within planetary boundaries? You know, to me, that is such a clear and relevant long term goal um, that any kind of business, including Google, you know, could be using. But I think there's other things you could be using as well. I mean, that future design idea of getting dressed up in the orange robes, again, as imaginative thought experiments when you're doing planning for the long term, get dressed up and imagine that you're in 2060 or 2080 or 2100. Um, you know, try and have conversations across that kind of intergenerational divide. I think those are things you could be thinking about. And then I sort of have little pet projects as well, which is probably more um, Amazon than Google, but I'd love to invent a new kind of buy now button, like a buy later <laughs> button. So, you know, you press, when you press buy, you get a drop down menu and you have the option to buy now, but there's also maybe buy in a week or buy in a month or buy in a year or borrow from a friend. And if you press buy in a year, you'll get an email in a year's time asking whether you really want to buy that third yoga mat. So I think we need to be thinking smart about how to, you know, turn technologies towards uh, long-term vision. They clearly have that potential. I mean, just to give you a little example, not so much of a technology, but of the nudge potential here. And this might sound tangential, but I think it's relevant. So people in Britain, when they write their wills, around 6% of them will naturally leave um, a charitable bequest. So they'll, they'll leave money in their wills for... Uh, you know, a, a charity, a, an animal charity or a human charity heart foundation for when they die. That's leaving a gift to future generations. Um, now, that's long term thinking beyond their own deaths. But the thing is, so that's six percent of people. But if you ask people just when they're writing their wills, would you like to leave a gift, a charitable a gift, uh, a charitable bequest? Suddenly it goes from six percent to 12 percent. And then if you say to them, you know, a lot of people like leaving a charitable bequest in their wills. Is there uh, an issue that you are really passionate about? Suddenly it goes from 6 to 12 to 17 percent. So even with a few little nudges, a new few reminders, you can get people to think long term. So that will be my challenge to people working in the various parts of Google. How can you switch on that little part of the acorn brain and not just be caught in the marshmallow brain. And let me just add one little more thing. I noticed in the uh, chat that someone had said that the marshmallow test is very questionable. Um, I agree with that, absolutely. The marshmallow test has been subject to serious critique because we know, for example, that it's very affected by socioeconomic positioning too. So wealthier kids have more ability to resist eating the treat. Those who face scarcity or don't trust the testers are more likely to eat up the marshmallows. So the marshmallow test isn't pure, but let's remember the acorn brain. Switch it on. It's it's a, it's very interesting, Roman, that you mentioned the differences between um, the, the, the economics of the people who are taking the survey, because I think it's a good segue to the next question that Ashwini asks. It's like, how can we make such ecological communities in countries where population is a big issue and where everyone's fighting for resources? Yeah, that's a really, I mean, there's two really interesting parts of that, I guess. How do you create an ecological community? And then how do you create it uh, where there are, you know, population issues? I think population is a very complex but important issue to address here. I think it's clear that the world we have has not been designed for 7 billion people or the 10 billion people we're going to have by 2050. Most of our institutions Nation states, representative democracy, consumer capitalism were developed in the 17th, 18th, 19th century when population was much lower. But how do you solve the population issue? Well, we know the answer to that. 
the, the main answer to that that you know development thinking has been pointing out for for decades now is investment in girls education particularly in developing countries investment in women's rights um, send girls to school send children to school um, and because that is what reduces reproductive rates I mean that's the ultimate best way to do it and we've seen this empirically you know for decades now so that's one thing that we could uh, be doing um, but of course I think we need to be combining that with new kinds of education um, so I really believe that the idea of being a good ancestor in this kind of long-term thinking should be part of um, our education systems we should be teaching futures thinking scenario planning teaching about the long-term goals that we should be trying to achieve there are organizations which are really trying to do this like in Canada, the David Suzuki Foundation has created a really impressive set of school curriculum materials to embed that idea of ecological thinking. And in terms of creating ecological communities, well, of course, there are ecological communities around on the one hand, because we've got indigenous people around the world, those of them that are living within planetary boundaries. But let's remember this, that in the last 50 years, something extraordinary has happened which is that we have seen the emergence of a huge decentralized religion emerge on a global scale. This religion is called the global environmental movement. Literally hundreds of thousands of organizations dedicated to a sacred cause. Now, they don't, they're do not they not all explicitly religious. They don't have God written into their, whatever God it might be, into their mission statements. What I mean by them being religious is that they are dedicated to looking after planet Earth, about the a sacred kind of mission to protect Gaia, the planet herself. That's what they share. So that's why I think of it as a decentralized religion. And in fact, so I think the global environmental movement in its various ways, decentralized, embodies the idea of ecological communities uh, as well. And we need to be drawing on their power and embedding ourselves within them. But certainly, I think it's a really good question about how we make those communities. And I really think actually they're going to thrive best within cities um, and city bioregions. So Amsterdam is a good example of that, adopting the donut. Someone else I mentioned saw in the chat mentioned the circular economy. Well, Amsterdam has adopted circular economy goals to be 100% circular by 2050, 50% circular by 2030, um, and have no fossil fuel cars by 2030. The donut model is helping them to get there. And in fact, Donut Economics Action Lab that runs the donut model um, is working with Circle Economy, the Amsterdam-based organization, in order to bring these two models together. So to dematerialize, decarbonize, and live within planetary boundaries. That's very insightful. Thanks, Roman. And I there's a very interesting related question from Daniel, who says, what might dispose a culture towards either long-term thinking or short-term thinking? And just as a reminder, we'll, I might do another question, one last question after this, if time permits. So that's fascinating to think about where, whether certain cultures are disposed towards long-termism. I mentioned a moment ago that intergenerational solidarity index, which is in my book, The Good Ancestor. And when you look at the countries that score highest on that, well, what you've got is it got an interesting mix. You've got some Scandinavian countries like you know, Sweden and Iceland and so on. Then you've also got some kind of almost kind of Confucian cultures. Um, so you do have some countries like, you know, China does do quite well and Singapore and so on. But but then you've got another kind of mix in there. You've got countries like Costa Rica and Uruguay doing well as well as, and Sri Lanka. So I think there's no hard and fast rule about different sort of cultures on a national level. I think what we find are indigenous cultures are particularly good at long-term thinking. It's deeply embedded. So in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, in Maori culture, they have a concept called whakapapa, spelt with a W-H, whakapapa, which is their idea for lineage or genealogy. That is the idea that we are all in a great chain of life, stretching far into the past and long into the future. And it so happens that the light is shining right here, right now on the present moment. And what we need to do is to broaden that light. So we kind of feel that the living, the dead and the unborn are all here in the room with us. So I think the more we can learn from those cultures in a way, the better, because I think um, there is this kind of cultural outlooks of deep stewardship, the sense of interdependence with the living world, which is a key instigator for long-term thinking. That's why I believe ultimately to be a long-term thinker, you need to fall in love with the living world, to fall in love with ice sheets and savannas, with rivers and with mountains. 
It's very interesting, actually. So the final question is related. Um, Kunal asks, um, uh, in your view, Roman, what is the single most important human quality needed to ensure human race not only sustains for the long term, but also thrives as a species? God, that's a big question, a bit <laughs> unfair. What is the quality? I would say it might be this deep time humility to recognize that humankind is just an eye blink in the cosmic story. Um, you know, the age of the earth, if you think about the age of the earth, one metaphor for it is that if the distance from your nose to the end of your outstretched hand is the whole age of the earth, well, one stroke of a nail file on your middle finger erases human history. That's how short we have been here for. History goes back billions of years, and it will go forward billions of years. Whatever creatures that might be around when our son dies will be as different from us as the first we are from the first single-celled bacteria. So let's ask ourselves, who are we to break the great chain of life with our damaging ecological actions, with our deadly technologies? Get a little bit of deep time humility into your life. Recognize we're just an eye blink in the cosmic story, and we might well develop that deep respect that we need to become the good ancestors that future generations deserve. Thanks, Roman. I think that answer comes from deep wisdom. And I especially love the visualization that you had, which showed that there are trillions of humans yet to be born. And that's a very powerful visualization to cultivate uh, deep time humility. Thank you so much for uh, doing the talks at Google for the second time. It was a very deeply insightful talk. And then we're lucky to have you. Folks who are watching us on the live stream, you can check out Roman's website on the description in the YouTube description below. And you can also find out the path to purchase his book, which releases next week in the US. Again, thank you so much, Roman. It was a privilege to have you. Thanks well, for such fantastic. a great talk. And thank you for having me on. And sorry, I couldn't answer more of the questions, but write to me on Twitter and I'll try and answer them there. <laughs> Thanks, Roman.